Open your ears and crack some beers. You are listening to episode 26 of Retro Hangover. Internet. I'm your co-host, Chris Copleen, and we are publicly procrastinating prostitution. Probably fucking alliteration is failing me right now. I just want to say <laughs> prostitution. And we spelled fucking with a PH, so it's like a silent alliteration. Yeah. It's a silent alliteration. But in any case, here's <laughs> our uh, just here's our host, fucking Shane Koski. <laughs> Well, thank you. Uh, as it might be apparent, uh, Chris may or may not have been as prepared with his alliteration this week, but I told him just to do it off the cuff, and this is what we got. So it, it failed. Deal with it. Uh, so, uh, so Chris, what's you? Uh, what have you been up to since uh, since we talked last? We got a lot of stuff going on. It's the holiday season, right? Which means I I really don't have shit going on except work, and and work sucked. Um. Not that works is that, hard. Is that different from from usual or? No, it works usually pretty easy. What I'm doing right now, um, mm. I'm not going to go into finer detail because you know you never want to, you know, ex- play your hand or anything like that yeah. or get ahead of yeah, yourself. You know. But this you week get was doxed. I, well, I won't get doxed. I hope unless I'm going <laughs> and doing stupid shit on Twitter, um, which <laughs> is never out of the realm of possibility. But for me, mm. it pretty much is. But um. Uh, no, this week was just like an atrocious week in terms of, uh, uh, of work. The week before wasn't so much. And, but this week was more of those, you just look at the stupidity of people you expect to be professional and do things that you're supposed to do. And you're just like, holy crap, I did not expect like this kind of things. So uh, that's the amount of detail I can get into because if I really get into more details, people wouldn't understand, of course. But um, uh, it work sucked this week. But in the the positive news is that yeah, the more the more important things, the more important things, the more important things, Fidget games. Yes, Uh, I completely reorganized my little office area. So nice. now my uh, Nintendo 64, my NES, and my Turbo Graphics are no longer on the floor. They are proudly displayed in a little entertainment area. And is there a hierarchy to that, or are they all just kind of side by side? Th- there is a hierarchy into it, but it's not. So, so the much... Nintendo 64 is at the top, clearly. No, no absolutely not. <laughs> um, actually, at the top, what's at the top? Uh, the top okay, is... I don't. Ag- I don't agree with this at all. Then at the top is my Sega Saturn and my Sega Dreamcast. So, Mm. but it's more of a, how the connections work and what's RGB, what's what I can swap out because I have my Sega Genesis, my turbo and my master system all sharing the same power supply and, Mm -hmm. uh, my Genesis and my master system share the same, uh, connection because they're both RGB. So they have to be next to the PlayStation, which is also RGB and my Saturn and my, um, Dreamcast are completely are uh, composite because I don't have I want to get the uh, component cables for the Saturn the dongle that comes from HD Retrovision I, I, I want to get that because that's where my com- uh, component cables from uh, my Genesis come from so I'd love to get that because holy crap on a CRT the Genesis looks absolutely br- beautiful with RGB connection so <laughs> it I looks bet. gorgeous but I, I rearranged everything it looks a lot better it's a lot more organized I don't want to take up too much time with this. Uh, how about you, Shane? What have you been up to? Well, certainly not that much video game organizing. Although, to be fair, I actually did do a little bit. Um, we, we were restructuring the living room over here, and um, ah. we got a pretty badass little um, faux fireplace, which looks really nice. nice. Very uh, apropos for the season. And uh, it also came with like this really nice wood entertainment center thing kind of built around it so i was able to take some of the consoles that i've had up on this floating shelf that's underneath my tv in the living room and sort of move them down into the uh entertainment center so it cleared up a lot of space everything looks a lot more organized now so 
the the stuff on the top i uh, mine is actually kind of hierarchically set up because I, i've still got my 360 because i still have a backlog of some games that i actually want to finish on that someday mm -hmm. and it's also kind of functions as a netflix box yeah. but um that's up on the top shelf where it was before on one side and then the other side i've got the switch and i bought a third party dock for charging both of my pro controllers for it so that thing's pretty cool it's sitting right next to it glows blue you know it's badass um so that's there and then i've still got my wii u that's in the entertainment center now along with the blu-ray player uh and then like all of my 360 physical games and the wii u games and stuff like that are all in the uh the shelving so it uh it looks pretty nice. It's it's nice to have storage space. So, so, you know. When are you getting that PS4? I mean, I don't know, man. I might... Uh, maybe I'll get it for Christmas. I don't know. Maybe you will. I mean, but that would be before January 19th. I think you uh, want it on you January, mean January 19th. January 29th, you mean? 29th, whatever. There's a 9 in there, <laughs> and it's in yeah. January. And I know it has uh, a number before it. That's all that matters. It does, yeah. Um, and yes, that would be before that, which would mean I would be prepared for, you know, whatever game happens to come out in January, you know, whatever whatever happens to come down the line. If if it's a gift, you better get a pre-order receipt because there's a special edition <laughs> for your ass and you know what it is. Yeah, I, I know, I know. I, I saw the, the special edition PS4 Pro with the Kingdom Hearts stuff on it. And yes. I'm going to be honest as much as I really want that and really want to make an irresponsible decision and buy it, mm -hmm. um, I can't really justify spending the money for the pro. I don't have like my, my 65 inch TV in my living room is just a, I mean, it's a 1080 P man. So like you're really not going to get a whole lot of fidelity improvement, um, over just a you know a base PS4, especially future proofing the new, newer SKUs. Future proofing, dude. By the time I get around to getting a 4K TV, there's gonna be a new generation of consoles out anyway, or we just won't have consoles anymore. So, but you could always go back and play your Kingdom Hearts because you know backwards compatibility. Fuck that. <laughs> right. Which, Which coincidentally is, yes. <laughs> is is an excellent segue <laughs> into uh, what we what we happen to be talking about this week. So, since you brought it up. Chris, yes. what, uh, what are what are we talking about? Uh, so today we're going to be talking about game preservation, which is very important in today's gaming uh, atmosphere, if I would say, um, and how we do it. But I don't want to go too much into it because I wrote a brief intro into this. So I will go into the brief intro of our topic today, if you don't mind too much, Mr. Ka. Uh No, Mr. Copeland, please take it away. So uh, today we're talking about game preservation, uh, a periodic topic of discussion that usually comes about due to varying issues. Maybe a digital-only release disappears from the storefront, a popular ROM site just disappears one day, or a game compilation release is missing a key title. Regardless, the question that is soon asked is, how do we preserve games so that they can be enjoyed for years to come? Almost all forms of media or art have found some method of preservation or an assurance that even cult favorites can be enjoyed in perpetuity. Video games are still trying to find this answer. We shouldn't ignore the fact that video games are one of the youngest forms of media, art, and entertainment. Every media has experienced problems with their preservation over time. It's not like every story that has gone through the printing press is still accessible or that every script for a play, song pressed sheet, or film recorded can be enjoyed by anybody at any time, or hasn't been lost forever. But the industries around those media have found better ways of preserving their art. Today we'll be discussing our thoughts on what are problems for video game preservation and possible solutions that these titles can be enjoyed for future generations. Yeah, and so a couple things to note. Um, Go ahead. One, uh, between the two of us, though I think we like to think that, you know, maybe we have all the answers, I feel like there should be a caveat thrown out there that these are all just pontifications, and if we had the answers to these problems, then, well, we'd probably be doing it. Um, the second one is that this this 
particular topic is pretty near and dear to to us um mm-hmm. particularly because of i don't know this this little podcast that we happen to run here kind of focuses on you know the uh the classics the the older generations of games and things like that so the fact that there are efforts to preserve those things and, and a lot of the challenges that they've been facing for several years now um is very important to us so it's extraordinarily important um i think it's 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 more of a reflection of just media in general i think we see a lot of other media forms they they get that that benefit um they get their redistribution they get their uh re-releases um and they get it in their original form and that's something we'll probably get into um a republishing or retranslation of something if it's really good will will we'll stay that way in terms of uh, all other media. Mm-hmm. The, there's this desire to remaster to improve, and I would use air quotes if you could see me right now. But it would be to improve what was already going on with with the previous it's, it's, media. It's kind of like taking the George Lucas approach <laughs> to remastering mm-hmm. a video game. Well, well, take for example like Resident Evil. Right, and and by no means mm. is Resident Evil a game that is by any means a threat to being lost to history. But you look at Resident Evil and you see that it had a remaster on the GameCube that has been re-released as well. You can get it on the PS4 if you're really interested. But that doesn't count, I don't think, as a way to say that the game has been preserved, the original game has been preserved. And so if you do that with a movie, that's like saying a movie has been remade. But, that, you know, you always hear that with the discussion. Well, have you seen the original? The original is so much better. Um, video games aren't at that point, I don't think. It's it's more like, have you played the original? Maybe the remaster is far better. I know in the case of the remake, our remake, that the, the remake was better. But mm-hmm. the original game is still something worth playing. Oh, yeah. Just look at history. So the, the first thing I would really want to touch on is some ways that we lose games. And the first thing I want to really touch on is probably the most egregious example of how we're losing games today. Because you can always go back and say there's a lot of ways that we lose games just because we forget about them. Or, you know, the time passes and they're just not re-released due to many various reasons. But today we live in a digital age. We live in an age where a lot of games are digital only. So when those games are lost... Uh, because licensing reasons or a company just decides to delist them, there's no real way to recover them unless you own it on your system or have it. I don't want to say own it, but have it on your system or a console or PC or whatever have you, your hard drive, that you can replay it, but it's not accessible. So like an example of this is like um, PT from Hideo Kojima and Konami, which you cannot get anywhere anymore right yeah and so this this whole digital revolution that we've had for well many years now but it's it's a significant enough portion of this um topic that it's something that we've actually discussed before yeah and this goes and, uh, way back for us it does anyway. yeah well yeah yeah <laughs> for us especially but um yeah and so it's kind of a double-edged sword right like as we discussed way back um the convenience factor is a big one for yeah. sure. Uh, and you know, I mean, I'm, I, I don't want to say guilty necessarily, but, uh, I, I am party to this sort of paradigm shift in that I actually, the majority of the games that I own are digital only now. Like I have, I own a switch and I love that thing, but I've never bought a physical cartridge for it. I've downloaded everything wow. because yeah, well, it's, it's just, it's easier for me. It's simpler. I can store everything on the SD card. I don't have to carry around cartridges. I'm not, and I think this is where Chris and I differ in that, like, I'm not looking to own the physical copies to like have an actual collection. Um, I actually like the convenience of just having it all digitally stored in one spot. Mm-hmm. Um, but you know, w- naturally what comes along with that is that eventually that's going to get lost right so as soon as they move on to whatever their next platform is and nintendo is one that's particularly egregious about this is um 
you know, not carrying those forward into future hardware generations in that a lot of the times you have to end up rebuying the game again or they re-release it as a, you know, remaster or something like that. Um, but I, I absolutely know that I'm running that risk and mm -hmm. it's in a way it's unfortunate um, because a lot of these games, particularly ones that didn't even get a physical release, because that happens more often now than, than ever. Um, if they ever inevitably, I would argue, get removed from, you know, whatever online storefront they happen to be served from, where else are you going to get it? You know, unless someone is doing the legwork of buying and downloading these games and storing them somewhere, then really all you have to go on is the hope that the developers of the game archived that source code somewhere and didn't lose it, which happens more often than you'd think. Well, it happens a lot. Uh, but sticking with it with the with the digital thing before we get to like the source code fact yeah. is you, you say we differ and going back to our our first I think it was our first episode where we talked about digital versus physical. Um, mm. My mindset's changed a little bit in the past three years. It's just because digital is more convenient. Uh, I wouldn't say it's necessarily better because you know at the end of the day, if you have a physical copy, you can play that physical copy. If you don't have an online connection. Um, or you can't download it to your system anymore and you have your memory gets erased or whatever the case might be. But digital, I, I, I've turned, I've turned the corner on that and I've realized, okay, digital has its benefits, but there are some games that just don't get that physical release and you lose it permanently. And they got to go back to PT. PT never got a physical release. Obviously uh, Scott Pilgrim versus the world. The game never got a physical release anywhere. Yeah. Um, I still have that one installed on my 360. I still do too. Uh, and a lot of the WiiWare, and I didn't get any of the WiiWare games, uh, were the original WiiWare titles. They're mm -hmm. never going to, unless they re-release them, they're never going to have a, another way to play them because the Wii shop is closed permanently. Um, right. and there's no physical copy of it. And that's the, that's the danger you run with, with digital media. Now, is it convenient? Absolutely. Uh, but you're right. You know, how do you recover those games? How do you play those games? Uh, how do you go back and look at what they did? And you just got to hope that it. You, the only real way you can do it is emulation at the end of the day, unless they re-release them. And, and when I talk about emulation, I mean, you know, of course, illegally, uh, you know, going to a ROM <laughs> site and getting those ROMs if you've never played it before and you don't own it. But that's the only real option you have if you want to play uh, the Castlevania Adventure Rebirth. You don't have the physical release and you don't have a real method to play it. So what do you do? How do you preserve those games so that people beyond it can do that in that case? Yeah, and and it puts gamers in a very precarious legal position, really. I mean, it's so it's been a gray area for decades. Um you know, where you've had ROM sites and emulators out there in the wild. And if you knew where to look, you can get them. You can still get them now. I mean, it's been in the news a little bit more prominently recently with Nintendo um, taking down some of the more popular ROM sites. Um, but it, yeah, it puts us as gamers in a weird place because honestly, and, and I, I feel like I speak for the majority of of gamers obviously there's outliers but if we were given a proper legal way to obtain these games um easily we would do it and i think that gets proved that's been proven i mean steam kind of proved that right steam is, is phenomenal it? right now yeah yeah and and so that kind of proved that where it was like well you know um here's this issue where, you know, maybe you can't go out and buy a copy of it or what have you. Uh, but now you have things like steam, which was of course, basically the first real robust digital marketplace. And then you had uh, good old games step in years later. Um, now I'm unknown, I think just as GOG, I think they dropped the long name, but um, where their, their original, you know, sort of mission was to be a digital storefront for all of those older titles that you really couldn't find elsewhere. And so they did the legwork of, you know, packaging those titles in with a copy of DOS box so that it would emulate, uh, mm -hmm. you know, an MS DOS environment. So you could run it on a modern machine. And so that was great. Um, and that also kind of proved that point that yes, we could go out and, you know, illegally, and I'm air quoting that also, um, 
download, you know, copies of these games that we couldn't get anywhere else and technically be in violation of those laws but it's like well what else are you going to do i mean this we just talked about that too briefly in our diablo episode where it's impossible actually or nearly impossible to legally obtain a copy of that game because blizzard has never re-released it so unless you can find uh, a cd copy of it uh, on eBay or at a yard sale or a Goodwill or something, then your SOL, unless you're going to go and download an ISO of it off the internet, you know, which again, falls into this sort of gray area of, of legality, but what else are you going to do? I think that goes back to Nintendo, really. Um, I, w- I just want to touch on that, and, and it, it includes Niablo for the reason that you said. Why would you... <sighs> And it's, it's, it's more of a, a emotional response than, than a logical response. Because the logical response is, you own the rights to these games. Of course, you want to prevent them from being released. But the emotional response is, you never want to make money off of these games. Now, Nintendo does re-release them. They give you legal avenues to, to play a lot of their games. I will give Nintendo that. They are very active in trying to preserve their history. I mean, look at the SNES Classic, the NES Classic, the Virtual Console on the Wii and Wii U... Um, well, I feel like I could make a counter argument on that one. It's not that they're doing a fantastic job of preserving their backlog. It's just that they're doing a fantastic job of capitalizing on it and preserving it as a byproduct. But isn't that their job as a business? Sure, sure. And I mean, right like, you, like you said, though, well, of course, but like you said, this, this is an emotional, visceral response. This yes. isn't like a, a logical one where I'm just like, you know what? Fuck those guys. Well, they're trying to said, make like- money on their own shit. <laughs> The, the the logical and and reasonable response, as you know, as, as, if you look at it as a be, as a business, yeah, they have absolutely every right to shut down ROM sites that that try to have their properties and IPs available for free to people. But when right. you look at it, like, I don't want to buy Little Samson for fucking twelve hundred dollars. I don't want to fucking do that. <laughs> I don't think anyone wants to do that. I don't think there's any reasonable person that's like, you know what, R- Little Samson's worth a grand. No, it's not worth a grand. But especially if you can go to a ROM site and download it for free and get an enhanced experience with it because it's you have save states and everything like that. But if Nintendo – and Nintendo doesn't own the rights to Little Samson. I'm not sure who does. I, don't, I can't remember who does. Either Taito or uh, Irem. But one of them owns it. And they don't have the rights to Little Samson. But they can go on ROM sites that have Super Mario Brothers 3 and can say shut all your shit down. So – is that Nintendo being an asshole? Is that Nintendo, you know, doing the wrong things? Not necessarily, but emotionally, you want everything that has ever been available and every thing from a ROM standpoint available to you. You want that if you want to experience game history. Nintendo, and I think that's why Nintendo goes after it, right? Because they have an opportunity to make a profit off their previous IPs, and they still do, right? Even with the Switch not having a virtual console with their Nintendo Online. And they have like the $20 a year and they're still getting $20 a year. Whether or not you want to say it's not a lot, it's still $20 a year from, you know, 10 million, 20 million people. That's a lot of money. And you you can re-release these virtual consoles. That's incentive for you to go play NES games on your Switch, the Nintendo one. And they're going to have more. And that's well, so I, I don't think I don't think that. How do I how do I want to say this? I don't hold it against Nintendo for protecting what is their property, right? Mm-hmm. I, 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 that's their prerogative uh, as a corporation, and they're well within their rights to do that. Uh, I think, at least me personally, and I know this is turning into kind of like a mini Nintendo bashing session here, but I, uh, I take issue with how how they are approaching it. It's not because they're going out there and saying, "Hey, this this site." that has every NES game any globally, not just, you know, North American market, but every single ROM available. You can download it in one package, boot it up in an emulator. I don't know, put it on a friggin' Raspberry Pi if you want to and plug a controller in and go nuts. We're going to shut that down, but we're not going to give you an equivalent alternative. That's what I take issue with is because they're what they're doing with it right now is it's not the virtual console it's this ridiculous drip feed of games where you get three nes titles from your nintendo online subscription and it's what is shit. It, once, once a month i and think it's shit. 
and they're and they're by and large they're bad selections yeah and so it's like there's no there's actually no logical reason to do that other than i don't know what extending the life of these nintendo online subscriptions in the hopes that maybe a year or two years from now they'll release the rom of the game you actually wanted to play i mean it's it's ludicrous they are they have it within their ability to just go and create some sort of like NES streaming service where you could just boot up your switch and you can play any NES game directly from there. I mean, require an internet connection if you need it. I personally don't care about that. I know that that's a topic that is touchy for some people, especially because I know there are folks that live in places that have spotty internet and that sucks. But I'm okay with the fact that, you know, if they need to require an internet connection because it's like a stream rather than downloading the ROMs, fine, whatever. But create like the Netflix of Nintendo, you know, you could have a whole back catalog of all that stuff and charge a monthly fee if you wanted to. People would totally pay it. I mean, hell, I would probably pay it because that would be awesome. But instead, they're taking this approach that is very clearly done in, in, a, in a specific methodical manner. Um, to maximize whatever profit they can get out of it. And that's the thing that I kind of take issue with. I, I, I'll be about a Netflix approach to it. I think that's what the Switch will ultimately be with their... I hope so. ...the category. I hope I hope so as well. Um, because you look at the PS3 and you look at the PS1 and PS2 classics and how they're not available on the PS4, and you wonder what's going to happen to all those purchases when your PS3 dies. Because inevitably your PS3 is going to die. The hard drive is going to die. It's it's oh, sure. not it's yeah. not eternal. So And I mean to be fair, like physical media is also not immune to that. I mean you've got like Game Boy cartridges that are dying, you know. It, it it's a problem all around. And, and CDs are more prone to this than like I said with bit rot than cartridges are. Cartridges are gonna last a little bit longer than CDs. So what do right. you what do you do? And especially if you've lost the source code. And there's some pretty significant games that have lost their source code and, and yeah so can, let's let's talk about that because yeah. i i want to i want to talk about that one a little bit absolutely so let me let me give a little introduction to source code um well i can't explain it so shane is probably going to explain a lot le- le- better than i i can because shane if <laughs> i was if, like honestly i was like all right chris wants to explain source code fucking let's go knock, knock yourself out man <laughs> i'm not going to explain all right. Well, Source Code was a movie released in. Yes. Uh, uh, yeah. But, <laughs> but I, I just want to go down uh, the line of some games that have lost their source code, and and yeah. Shane Shane is uh, a person who understands source code probably very well, at least compared to me. Uh, uh, so I'm just. Going I have to... I have a degree. You have a degree in source code. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, specifically that. Yes. In sport, in source code. So um, some of these titles might be surprising because some of them have come back uh, for various reasons, and I'm sure Shane will touch on it. But here are some notable games that have lost their source code. Icewind Dale 2, which is why you didn't mm-hmm. see a re-release of it. Kingdom Hearts. Uh, Silent Hill, like pretty much one through three. Final... Oh, I have so much to talk about that one. Yep. Keep going. Uh, Final Fantasy VIII, which is why on your Switch you'll be getting 7 and 9, but not 8. Uh, Panzer Dragoon Saga, which is probably a major reason that game is worth $500 plus, which would be stupid enough to buy that. Um, I can't imagine. Me neither. Um, Sonic the Hedgehog and uh, The House of the Dead are the arcade version. And there's probably plenty more it, it, because Sega, it's, it's historically documented that Sega has done a terrible job of preserving their source code for their uh, Model 16 version of their arcade hardware. They, they they ruined it. But in any case, those are some big games and those are that's not exclusive. There are plenty more. So Shane, please, please tell us why it's so critical that a video game company maintain the source code uh, for their games. Yeah, absolutely. So, all right. A lot of people ask this question, right? When you're talking about preserving digital media and games specifically, uh, well, you know, you, the game is out there, right? So if, if you have a retail copy of the game, the, I mean, the code lives there, right? Like you can just take it out and, you know, recreate it. And the answer to that is kinda, um, so some, 
folks out there who honestly are much more dedicated and intelligent than I am in this realm um, take it upon themselves to go and do kind of exactly that, where you can sort of reverse engineer um, what is on a retail copy of a game. Now, the way that that works kind of at a high level, right, is that the developers of a game will write the code in whatever their chosen programming language is. But regardless of what it is, uh, ultimately it gets translated down into, you know, assembly code, very low level stuff that, you know, that's the kind of bits and bytes and the ones and zeros that get fed to, you know, the hardware of, you know, your computer or your console that actually runs the software. So that's kind of the end state, regardless of what language a developer uses. And that is what you're going to get when you try to reverse engineer a software application like a video game. So the problem with that is, yes, you can extract quite a bit actually from that. Um, you can pull graphics assets, you know, the sound files, what have you, you can pull all that out of there. That's actually pretty easy to do. A lot of games, people have created model viewers and stuff where they've ripped those assets out and you can go and look at that stuff. Even if you don't have the game it's just kind of available like wow is a good example of that there's mm -hmm. like a wow model viewer built into a lot of fan sites and things of that nature so that part arguably is actually a little bit easier the more difficult part is when you're looking at that very low level uh system code you kind of have to make a lot of inferences and assumptions about what the logic is it, it, what logic is actually occurring there and what the or developer originally wrote. So as I said, more intelligent folks than myself can look at that stuff. And with the assistance of tools, um, other software that helps with the reverse engineering process, you kind of have to work backwards and figure out step-by-step step the thought processes of the developers that originally put that game together. And Anybody that has been involved in any sort of programming or software development at all will know that um, as much as we like to think that everything would be great and your code is clean and it's structured properly and commented really well and all that, that almost never happens because this is real life and shit happens and there's this thing called crunch that happens more often than not in the video game industry where people are spending 60 hours a week at the office and they're sitting there at two in the morning and they just really need to bang something out and hope that the damn thing compiles so the last thing on their mind is making really nice clean readable code that's just the reality of it so that makes it more complicated um so that's kind of a longer backstory to why the source code itself is so important. Because if your original developers save those original source code files prior to it being compiled and translated into that machine code, then that can be used basically straight away. You can just take that, port it over, and of course there's some work involved, but um, you can rebuild the game with that original source code as if, you know, you were the original developer compiling that thing for the first time. Um, the problem is that historically, a lot of developers are really bad at that. Um, they didn't care or, or as I said, crunch happens and they don't think about it of actually preserving those original source files and archiving them somewhere digitally and safely to be used later. So that's where you get these situations like Silent Hill is a good example because that one really pissed me off <laughs> where actually large chunks of the original source code were just lost. They, they couldn't find it. And so when they went to do that remaster for uh, the 360 and the PS3, the developers that took that task on actually had to take a an old build of the game um, pre-release that was unfinished and go and basically refinish the game, recode the damn thing, fix bugs that were fixed in the original retail release years ago and try to kind of patchwork together, you know, a, a significant portion of that game. And so that is a large reason why that remaster turned out like garbage. Yeah. I, I think we have to remember too that, uh the reason that source code isn't protected like it was, and, and this even goes back to like Blizzard, like even a major company like Blizzard, even as late as the uh, late nineties with Starcraft and people finding that source code pretty much off an eBay buy. 
um, yeah. that yeah. it wasn't protected as much is it was all about profit. Like a lot of these video game companies do not view these creations that they're making, that the developers are making as art. They view them as profit and it's not necessarily a wrong idea to have. Um, well, but, it isn't, again, from a purely corporate standpoint, right? Yeah, it's not, from a purely corporate standpoint, it's not. Um, but, the, you know, because the, the same thing happens in Hollywood, right? Like, your movie is to make you money. And if it doesn't make you money, then fuck that movie. And I think a lot of these, uh, not, not developers, but producers, uh, mm -hmm. publishers, they have this viewpoint that this game is to make us money. And that's what it's for. So... It's it's hit. It's like if it makes us money, great. If it doesn't make us money, great. But like you look at Sonic the Hedgehog, the the original Sonic the Hedgehog, the source code was lost in the original Sonic the Hedgehog. That's a major fucking game. Yeah. But for the source code to be lost, in that even the House of the Dead arcade, that was a major fucking arcade release. How can you lose that? Um. But well, I mean, it, it's yeah, it's a combination of a lack of foresight, frankly. Of course. Um, and, and also, like you said, they, their their primary concern is cranking out new titles to keep generating profit and, you know, preserving the the source material of that um, was n hardly ever considered. Of course. And before we go to solutions for a lot of these mm. things, I, I want to briefly talk about uh, MMOs and patches and how... Oh, yeah. And how games, when they were released, are not the same as what they are later on. I yeah, I mean, it happens with any, not just MMOs, but any online only game, you know, because this whole like games as a service thing has been all the rage for several years now. And um, the side, but the byproduct of that is that these games live completely online. And if the servers go down, then that thing's gone. Um, and, and in addition to that, because they're sort of an iterative thing, uh, the version of, let's say, World of Warcraft that you have now looks almost nothing like what it looked like in um, what was it 04 I think is when it was released originally um, so you you lost a lot of things I mean WoW specifically you know they had the Cataclysm expansion which completely redid all of the old continents so the geography was the same but the topography was completely different they they changed around locations of things and, and so it looked nothing like what those zones used to look like um and so yeah you end up losing that and some like companies like blizzard are doing some things to kind of bring that back like they've got the classic wow servers that they're going to be bringing up i think in the next year um, which is supposed to kind of recreate that original World of Warcraft experience. Um, but it's never going to be exactly the same. Like even even Blizzard is kind of like trying to closely emulate what they used to have, you know. And one other thing I wanted to talk about with this one, too, is just the fact that, you know, you do end up losing these and probably will never get them back. Um Something like uh, City of Heroes was actually an MMO that I played for a number of mm -hmm. years with a few close friends of mine. And we had a blast with that game. I mean, for people that weren't familiar, I mean, at a high level, it was, it was basically a superhero MMO. You could create your very own superhero or supervillain. There was a, an expansion for that later. Um, and mix and match superpowers and create your own costume and it was it was a hell of a lot of fun it was kind of janky but in sort of a you know a, an endearing kind of way right um but that you know the servers got shut down for that game and so you can't play that at all anywhere and that's what happens with all of these online games and the only thing that saves those is uh the efforts of the community if you if a game has a dedicated enough fan base you know they'll go out there and kind of reverse engineer a lot of that stuff including the server tech in order to put up a you know a third party server and allow you to use that retail copy of something like city of heroes um and connect to a custom server and play the game as closely as they could recreate it but that's that's really all you got going for it because the original developers and the companies behind them aren't going to take the time because it's not it's not worth it to them and I, I do want to touch on that too, because 
I mean, I don't play MMOs anymore, but like, look at fin- Fantasy Star Online. In order to get to play Fantasy Star Online, you have to know where the private servers are. You have to know how to connect to it, and that's Dreamcast, GameCube, whatever systems it came out on. You have to know those things. And yeah. I, I look at a game, um, Alien Front Online for the Dreamcast, which probably very few people know about, and I'd be shocked if 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 they did outside of a select few that's where i got my handle from because i wanted to make my uh video game handle more sound more alien and stuff like that so i came up with the name zodiac and i spelled it weird and i still use that (laughs) i still use that handle to this day for for a lot of things but i can't go back and play that game there's no way i can go back and play that game i mean maybe i can get the the physical copy of it because the physical copy does exist but i can't play the game in the intention the way it was intended to be played. Right. Um, I have to play the single player campaign, which I'm sure is still there, but the, the multiplayer game, which is why I created my online handle the way I did is no longer there. Um, so, so we, we kind of talked about a lot of the ways that this stuff is getting lost, but, um, what are, so what's going on out there in the community? Like what are people doing in order to kind of prevent this from, you know, just kind of fading well, I mean, of course you have your emulations, you have your ROMs, you have your emulators. Uh, that's it's always going to be there. It's been there. I remember downloading emulators as early as probably the uh, 1996, 1997. So they, they've always been around. Of course, they have come under increased scrutiny from Nintendo, uh, and, and specifically Nintendo. I don't know any other major publisher that's going after ROMs. Uh, but Nintendo is is really going after them. So well, Sega certainly isn't. <laughs> Sega Sega is not. Sega I don't think Sega cares, but because they're still making money off all their shit. Uh, another way that they can do it is developers themselves release uh, compilations, which Sega does. SNK just did. Capcom has done in the past multiple times. Even Konami has in the 32-bit generation. Nintendo has with their uh, Virtual Console releases, and they kind of are now, just not to the same extent. Um, but of course, the cons to those are, you know, consoles move on, and if the company isn't willing to move on everything over to the new consoles, those things can be lost. I mean, look at the the, the Virtual Console on the Wii U and Wii. Uh, look at the PS3 and I mean, even look at the Xbox 360 to a lesser extent. Microsoft is doing a lot of goodwill, uh, but PC games are kind of doing it right. So if you're a PC gamer, you really don't have all that much to worry about because you probably know how to get all your old games playing on new consoles anyway. Um, other ways to do it are there are video game museums popping up and mm-hmm. that's that's critical because I don't think uh, video game museums were, were were taken very seriously. At least the idea of a video game museum was taken seriously ten, you know, even ten years ago. Just because this media is still so young, but there is a national video game museum. It's in Frisco, Texas, and they go around to these retro video game conventions and they put out their product and they let people see the history of it. I think uh, most recently the Portra- Portland video game expo retro video game expo they had a history of nintendo display where they Mm. had a complete set of the nintendo entertainment system video games and you could go and see the history of nintendo uh but of course there's more to video games than nintendo uh absolutely (laughs) what so um what do you do beyond that now i'm sure they they have that covered i'm not i haven't been to the museum i haven't been to frisco texas i i can't speak to it but there is so much more to it than just that and how much has been lost uh, to history where you cannot recover it. Uh, there's so many more solutions. How about you, Shane? What, what do you got? Yeah, I mean, and so, you know, you were talking about the m- measures, I suppose, that, you know, the companies are taking to move their, you know, back catalogs forward into these future generations. The, the issue with that, of course, is that that, is always going to be beholden to their stockholders, right? It's right. only they're only gonna, they're only going to do it if it makes sense for them financially. So, really, what we have to rely on is more of a grassroots effort um, of places like the National Video Game Museum. Um, there's several other ones out there, uh, whether they be groups or individuals who are dedicating the time and effort into uh, preserving, you know, the history of video games in a sort of um let's go with 
financially agnostic position. Um, so just a quick shout out to a few of them. Um, if any of you are interested in the preservation of video games, I would recommend going and checking these places out. Um, there's a guy called Patrick Scott Patterson. He uh, runs videogamepreservation.com. Um, there's also the Video Game Preservation Collective. Uh, there is VAPS, which is the Video Game and Archive, Arcade Preservation Society. Uh, and the Video Game History Foundation. And that is, of course, not an exhaustive list, but you can go and look those up and find out what they're doing. They're all doing good work towards it. Um, so we've got these sort of efforts at the ground level moving forward, but in a lot of ways, we're still kind of being held back by the legislation, right? Um, so I guess, is there really any hope for that uh, going forward? And the answer is kind of, Hopefully, maybe. Yeah. Um, some of you might have kind of caught this. Uh, it was actually in October of this year, so not very long ago. The uh, Library of Congress um, had passed a decision that kind of laid the groundwork for um, legalizing the preservation of video game content. Um, essentially, what it did is, among a few other things, created some exemptions to the Digital Millennium Copyright Act, which a lot of us know more colloquially as the DMCA. I think you end up hearing that more about YouTube <laughs> than anything. Yeah. Um, but um, just kind of a, a quick excerpt from that, it, it kind of goes as follows. So they said that the acting register found that the record supported granting an expansion in the relatively discrete circumstances where a preservation institution legally possesses a copy of a video game's server code and the game's local code. The record indicated that an exemption would enable future scholarship by enabling researchers to experience games as they were originally played and thereby better understand their design or construction. So that's big, um, but there's a few things that we kind of want to note in there that isn't necessarily in that particular verbiage. But um, this actually, at least as of right now, only applies in what is really kind of more of a rare and specific circumstance that the server and client code was obtained legally from the original rights holders of the game. And in addition to that, that the game is only made available uh, on the physical premises of whatever the preservation institution happens to be. Now, I would imagine that that might carry over to things like a, you know, a touring exhibit, um, like, you know, Chris was talking about a few minutes ago. Um, but it, it, these are steps forward, but they're, they're, they're baby steps because there, there's still these kind of caveats and these gotchas in there that, um, you know, are, are still going to kind of hold this back. I mean, realistically getting the original legit server code from the original rights holders in order to preserve these things is that's a big ask and that's not going to happen as often as you i guess you'd hope well of, co of course not because if you always see the potential to make profit off of anything you're going to go towards the route of profit and sure. sometimes just don't view something as being profitable at the moment, so you push it off to the side. I mean, going back to Little Samson, yeah, if they put that on the, the Switch virtual console or if they put that on uh, the PS4, how many people are going to buy it? You know, is it worth their time to re release that thing? And they might say, uh, yeah, maybe not my, now. My answer to that is that this is probably the most times anyone has mentioned Little Samson. <laughs> Well, yeah, I'm just using it as a for instance because it's a massively no, no, I know. Game. Yeah, no, um, for sure. But so, are they going to go through the problems of figuring out how to port it to the PS4? Are they going to go through the problems of porting it to the uh, uh, of Steam and hoping people buy it? I mean, Steam accepts anything, so why not, right? So, <laughs> uh, are they going to do it? Is it worth their time? Is it worth their money? And if it's not, they're going to say no. Um, but they still own the rights to it. They still own the ability to keep it. I don't know who owns the rights to Little Samson. I'm just talking shit right now. But what I'm saying is is that if, if you have a game in mind that you're like, why won't they re-release this game? One, it's probably because the source code is gone, like we talked about before, and they just can't. Or two, the rights holders are like, it's not profitable enough to re-release this game. Uh, it's not worth the trouble to recode this game, to put it on multiple platforms. We don't want to do it because we don't see the point in it. And that, that goes back, yeah, you can hold the rights. As long as you hold the rights, technically it's preserved. But 
if you don't re-release it, well, it's it's shit on everybody, right? So you just gotta hope that the people preserve it and, and hope for the best, really. Because uh, yeah, universe, I mean, universal media for video games isn't happening anytime soon. Uh, oh it, no, it, it never will. Um, well, I won't say never because PC gaming has done it, and and video games are going. I would say like the Xbox One and the and and the PlayStation Four went to the what x86 architecture, which is more uh-huh. universal with PCs. I know Nintendo right. does their own thing, but you'd lose that own thing if everything went went universal. Um, but I don't see it happening. No, I, I don't either. Um, and, and so I guess at the end of the day, it's I, I would say that it's probably a let's go with cautiously optimistic outlook. I think on it, but we really kind of end up having to rely on these sort of more, you know, guerrilla efforts from individuals and, and startup groups and things like that to, uh, to preserve these things, even if it's not a hundred percent legal, let's say, according to the, the, the current laws of the land, but they're the only ones doing it because they're not interested in, you know, the profit they can make on it. They're interested in, keeping these things alive for future generations to uh to experience so uh shane you ready to wrap this up uh i think so i think we could probably talk about this for a lot more because yes, there's, there's a lot of good stuff to talk about but uh i think we i think we covered a, a fair amount so if you're listening to this and you would like to hear a part two to game preservation uh, feel free to hit us up on any of our social media outlets or our email which is podcast at retrohangover.com i got that right didn't i shane <laughs> i was gonna let you get that one all on your I had, own so you, you I, did a I good had job to, i had to pause and think about it yeah podcast at retrohangover.com you could also find us on facebook instagram twitter uh everything youtube too just comment on one of our videos that we have up is retro hangover uh you can find us on youtube but if you want to hear a part two of this uh by all means, let us know uh, if there's something you would want us to focus on a little bit more. Uh, let us know as well for any future topics. You know, just hit us up. So um, I suppose until next time. Merry Christmas, everybody. We love you.